Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of our pep chats, our uh, live chats with uh, with cool people to explore the the challenges facing the world, the, the, the corporate world in in uh, post pandemic as we face into a new world of work and the new challenges of the hybrid world and what does it mean to have staff split up over different parts. Um, one of the 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 reasons that pep talk exists is that we recognized a number of years ago that the old school way of working probably was a little bit broken and that the, the, the human or the person at the center of the, the, the world um, was being forgotten a little bit by old school models of top down leadership. And, um, and what we thought was that, you know, it's undeniable from the research we see now that happy employees do better work. And this is kind of where, we're at in the, the, the pep talk world is understanding how do we engage teams, connect teams and get teams to, I suppose, as, as is part of why I'm involved, man, to help people understand what a high performance culture looks like um, in, in, the, in the corporate environment. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Niall O'Carroll. Um, um, my background is in sports psychology. Um, and in the last number of years, I've been working with Pep Talk on a kind of a, initially to build a kind of mental skills consultancy for the company. And since then, we've morphed into really driving the, the team engagement, team development kind of aspect of what Pep Talk does. Um, I'm really excited to be joined today by uh, our CEO, James Brogan. Um, James, uh, hey, man, how you doing? Um, James is... Uh, uh, a lawyer by training, but for some reason decided to take on the crazy world of tech startup. Um, and now uh, leads, te uh, leads Pep Talk as we kind of expand out into the world. We're now in, James, I think it's fair to say, is it 12 countries? Um, and maybe yeah, more again. More again yeah. yeah, thanks a million, Niall. Um, delighted to have a chance to join the conversation today and, and give a couple of perspectives. I'm really looking forward to, to join and by, by enjoyed by Danny now in a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, ultimately for me, Niall, as I say, Pep Talk's mission is about being the difference between good and great teams and creating an environment um, in the modern workplace for that to thrive. So I think this conversation is about trying to, you know, explore that in a bit more detail and ultimately hopefully help, help some of our listeners, um, you know, have some takeaways to think about what's happening in their organizations and how they might be able to put in place some new ideas to, to, to ultimately help and what's a quite an uncertain and, and challenging landscape for, 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 for all workplaces out there at the moment. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, I know. It's great to have you. And uh, it's also great. I'm really excited for today's chat. Um, we have uh, Danny McCoy. Danny is... Uh... Hey, Danny, how you doing? Hi there. Welcome to the chat. Danny is CEO of, of IBEC, Ireland's largest lobby and business representative group. Um, I, IBEC are a fairly massive organization. I mean, Danny, I think it's fair to say 250 odd employees yourselves, let alone, right, yeah. let alone right, serve yeah. the, uh, all the, 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 the big business requirements in Ireland. I think it's kind of fair to say that you're not really a big business in Ireland if you're not kind of connected with IBEC. Um, um, it's nice to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, one of the reasons I was kind of really excited to talk to you, Danny, is like your background is kind of fascinating. I mean, like what people probably don't know is that you're president of the Stati Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. And you've done a lot of work around, you know, you're a senior economist. You've done a lot of work around economics lecturing at Trinity College. And you've done work with um, Harvard Business Review and all these different organizations like that you're not just from a CEO perspective, but also from a understanding of research and statistical perspective, you probably have a very unique view of the challenges companies are facing right now. Yeah, probably. Um, and longevity is my other kind of <laughs> thing. Uh, I've, I've been CEO here now for uh, 13 years. And as, as you say now, my background is, is in economics, kind of academic and research. Um, and I suppose the last 15 years in Ireland, We've been going through one economic experiment from another. You know what I mean? The, the euro, uh, the euro changeover, given rise to that surge into the great financial crisis, um, and then back out again, where we've seen this takeoff of the Irish economy, which is practically it's more than doubled um, in the last eight years. 
um, because of the corporate tax world of the OECD work on this base erosion profit shifting, which has meant that a lot of corporate balance sheets have moved into Ireland because moving of intangible assets like brands and patents and copyright, you know, the, the modern world we live in, Ireland has been by far the global beneficiary of that um, so significantly. And, and then Brexit um, and then a pandemic and now back into, you know, I've been really lucky in my career, all these crises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just going to say it. Economic, um, I don't think I'd survive in a steady state CEO world, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And now we're navigating that potential world war. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's kind of like... Um, you I just show up at the scene of some accidents. I don't cause them now. <laughs> <laughs> there's a difference, going back to the statistical side, there's a difference between correlation and causation. <laughs> I just happened to be here. On the, uh, on the, the, the research topic, there's a thing, that I was looking at a, a piece of research by McKinsey and Cole where they were talking about the, the gap between employees' expectations and employers' expectations. Um, in, you know, if we, if we want to keep talking to the future world of work, but really it's just the world of work and work is constantly in a state of flux. As you say, you know, the, the economy in Ireland has been all over the place in the last 25 years. So, you know, working relationships are going to be affected by all that. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is, and it kind of, it ties into some research that Gallup did where they were looking at why um, employees were leaving um, work in, in, in large numbers when they talk about the great resignation. And they, the suggestion was that employers thought that people were leaving for more money but the reality of the employee was that they were leaving because of relationships with their managers and, you know, the culture was broken or whatever the case may be. When you're looking at it from your perspective and with the, the, the information you're hearing from all your members, what do you think are the big challenges to kind of find that to, to, to solve that gap between employers' expectations and employees? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question. And in fact, I think there's, for me, there's kind of two elements to it is, the last 10 years has been pretty spectacular uh, globally and has given rise to some of the reward to employees, um, which I'll come back to in a sec. Uh, and the other one then is COVID and the, um, you know, the disruption of hybrid working. Well, in fact, in truth, it hasn't been hybrid. It's been remote working, right? Yeah. You know, um, mm. We're struggling with hybrid at the moment where physically getting from a physical meeting to sit in front of a virtual screen, I'm, I'm struggling with anyhow. Um, but the 10-year the gap piece, I think, goes to the heart of what I was saying earlier about this transformation of the types of companies that are driving value, where, you know, before the great financial crash of 15 years ago, the top 10 companies in the world were pretty tangible. There were oil and gas companies, there were big engineering companies like General Electric, and then you move on to the world we, as we know it now, where a lot of companies have very few tangible assets, but it's all in the intellectual property, in the patents, brands, copyrights. The impact of that in the workplace is that the productivity that workers are providing are very often their combination with machine, effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, in a way that, of course, is always like that. But, I mean, this has become much more exaggerated, where the values... Um, that are extracted for the company can be quite extreme and the labor isn't actually the most significant part of it all of course the creator is and the the brains but then when you look at you know tech companies there's a bit of a euphemism about the word talent you know mm. <laughs> uh, you know if you tell somebody they're talented they they actually end up believing it um, and then you shouldn't be surprised when they come looking to be rewarded for their talent. Mm. Uh, and that kind of expectation, the point that the McKinsey's were saying, the expectations can be askew because uh, what, we, what we're lacking at the moment is an anchoring of expectations. You know, the expectations have kind of become a little bit stratospheric and there's no, there's nothing holding them down. Um, and that particularly is the case with wage expectations. Mm -hmm. So I think I think it is the case. It's always been the case that people leave people. You know, it's very often you just and people stay with people as well. You know yeah. that it's not always about money. And 
And I know people say this, that they're rational and so on, but one of the things I know from economics, I know from the statistics, and just even watching the reality TV shows, a lot of people don't know an awful lot about their own circumstances. You know, they don't even know what their net salary is. You see that in all the kind of own McKee programs and Eddie yeah. Hobb. Um, and they're good samples. And you know, people would oh, bristle uh, if you say this. Uh, you know, of course I know I live, you know, hand to mouth and so on. But the reality is, People are very bad at, at knowing. So salary actually, at the time of salary review, is a big deal for people. And they get hacked off if they feel they haven't got what they deserve. But they mm. kind of get over it. They get over it in a week, right? Particularly mm. if the culture in the place is good and they like it and they've purpose. You know, the money, the money is never the primary reason. But what mm. we're, we're observing right now is people are leaving and moving around right now. And in the past... You know, they'd always look for a promotion in terms of a bit more money, but it would be in the order like of 10%, 15%, that kind of zone of a bit of an uplift. In the market right now, you're seeing some just really outrageous percentages. You know, you're, there's 30, 40, 50 doubling of salaries kind of going on. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a real signal that there's a divorcing of expectations from reality. Yeah. And, um, you know, if people can survive a recession with their values and their preferences for work-life balance, then I'll be convinced. But right now, we're in a very false scenario because what's really driving the world right now is that there's way too much money in the global system. Um, it's just been, you know, because of COVID, the central banks, with the right instincts, wanted to keep everybody liquid, but they thought they were going to do that for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Ended up years later, leaving all that money in the system. Like to give you a, give you a sense of the scale, of this I find it hard to get my own head around it as an economist. Of all the U.S. dollars ever created in history, mm -hmm. nearly forty percent of them have been created in the last two years. Wow! To give you the sense of how much money, and and that that money then in the economics uh, it means there's just an excess demand for everything, yeah. and excess demand has three features. The price will go up. That's the inflation everybody's talking about, price inflation. You just can't get your hands on stuff, right? The supply mm -hmm. chain problems, you get rationed, and that can be the same in the labor market. And the third one, which doesn't get enough acknowledgement, but is very visible to anybody that's, uh, that's out there in experience uh, economy space, that the quality of engagement goes down. The quality of the products are going down as well. You know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of... There's a lot of things that are shoddy at one level because people can't get them. They put up with, uh, they put up with what they're going to get. Um, and again, people were bristled that say, "Oh no, we're consumers." Reality is, talk to members. People are in queues to get stuff. You know, mm. be that cars or whatever it might be, and they may have preferences for all the specs that they wanted. And you know, in mm. other years, I want the alloy wheels. Now they're going, "I'll take it." Yeah. You know, eat it the absence of not having something as opposed to having something that's slightly a bit imperfect. And you see that as well, you know, when you go out to a coffee or a restaurant, you may be being served by a teenager who wouldn't, yeah. find, the, who wouldn't find the fridge at home, but suddenly <laughs> you expect them to be, uh, to be <laughs> chilling it's actually, your wine. And, uh, it's yeah. actually fascinating you know, the, the employee gap at the moment in the sense that there's so many organizations out there screaming for staff and they can't get them. Mm -hmm. we, I don't take know. anybody. That's the point as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and that's not that, you know that's not good for the individuals themselves as they start careers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I'd be concerned, kind of uh, in a in a in a paternalistic kind of view, is that some of the young people are getting salaries now that could actually kind of destroy their expectations because one of the features of downturns and downturns do come is that if you're on a salary that clearly your productivity can't justify, even if you think you're talented, like some of the salaries for what's been offered up, you're a tall poppy. Mm. If that's the easiest cut. The one that doesn't productivity justify that's high in salary, mm. that's, that's one of the first to go and will be. And anybody who thinks the old rules have been, you know, they're in some kind of new uh, paradigm is that when the tide goes out, and that money will be sucked back in by the global central banks. Interest rates are going to go up. Liquidity will get tighter in the coming years. Mm. There's a real danger for a generation that actually ended up getting a bad start in their career, you know, mm. by 
disruption and getting too much money for what they were actually worth at that point in their career. There, there are people that will go on in time to deserve that money and more. But right now, the expectations are all out of kilter from a fairly unique moment in time. Yeah, it's fascinating. And James, I'll bring you in here. Um, you know, there's, you know, that there's some kind of startling stuff there, but there's also kind of, it takes my mind to thinking about instead of us focusing on the great resignation or whatever we want to call it, uh, or the great reimagining or whatever, you know, all the great terms are out there, but why it is that some people are staying loyal and why companies are retaining people in their organization. And I know that's something that you kind of feel passionately about with the work that you're doing here with Pep. Yeah, and I think, I suppose, from from my perspective, the interesting t- piece that ultimately, as Danny's touching on, I think if you look at the research and obviously Microsoft and others have done a lot of work in the last 12 months, you know, and there's a suggestion that anywhere up to 50% of your employee base are thinking about moving in the next 12 months. And if if the only kind of solution you have to that is, is wage increases, ultimately that's probably not a sustainable model. And certainly in the conversations that we're having now, um, I think organizations in some ways are acknowledging that um, in terms of the sustainability of it going forward. So I think that's where ultimately, as you say, it's about trying to understand what ultimately does keep people in organizations. And I think the big challenge for organizations ultimately now is they, it's the uncertainty around like retention is ultimately a lagging indicator. It, 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 mm. The problem is at your door. Uh, but what organizations tend to lack is leading indicators to help them make decisions around retention strategies, for example, with, with better data points as to what might be driving some of those more human factors, in, 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 you know, <laughs> impacting people's ability to, to perform and be productive and, and all that good stuff. So I, I think certainly in the conversations that I'm having with business leaders, uncertainty, and then ultimately the easy thing to go to is, well, let's just look at wages. But in reality, that's probably not a, it's not recognizing um, what ultimately drives people. I think McKinsey suggests, set, like for, 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 for an awful lot of people, I think it's 70% as per that report from McKinsey, perp, the purpose, the purpose of what you're doing is becoming increasingly the, 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 the enabler of performance and the reason why you might leave. So for us in, in pep talk, I guess, and what we hear, um, I think organizations acknowledge that, that, that certain things are going to have to change, that um, how we create an environment for people to, to feel part of a team, in particular in a hybrid environment where that's somewhat challenging. You're, you know, how do you build trust if you're not going to see everyone every day? How do you build connection? How do you create that sense of camaraderie with people? In some ways, when we were all at home, at least we were all on the one page. Now that we're still in the early stages of a hybrid environment where whether it's three and two, two and three, four and one, ultimately it's, it's harder. And the, and the word that we keep hearing is intentionality. This idea that if we're going to, to approach this world of work in a more intentional way, what does that look like? So what do managers need to do? What do our business leaders need to do? And, and I, I, I do think that there, there is a uh, movement towards acknowledging that people are ultimately looking at different things now and, and COVID and other pieces. And, and also there's always a bit of pent-up frustration after COVID. People are going to leave. I think there's an element of that as well at play. But I do think from, from my perspective as an, at an organizational level and talking to CEOs, I think helping them understand what's driving some of these um this movement in the resignation space is ultimately what they need because from that they can develop better strategies as to how they can 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 tackle it as opposed to a rather blunt instrument such as such as just going after the wage fee so i think danny comes with a really interesting perspective and i think in, yeah. in terms of pep talk and what we do it's about looking at that environment and and helping with the intentionality because i think and my last point is probably, you know, you, you kind of have culture carriers in an organization. And when we were all in the office, it didn't really matter. People kind of came in and, and certain people took that mantle. I don't think that happens now. I think ultimately we're seeing this new, actually only this week, we, we, we were told of this new concept in, in, in organizations of, of ghosting, where in the first three to six months, uh, an employee on boards, he, he's never really met anyone. And then suddenly the screen almost goes blank. <laughs> and the employee disappears. So he actually did that first year in, a, in an environment where you're not intentionally thinking about what that's going to feel like and look like. 
this is actually a real thing for organizations um, where, where the employee uh, ghosts the company and they almost just drop off the face of the earth. It's, 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 it was a big bit of a shock for me, but I, I think that's where we're at with some organizations yeah. in terms of the experience. Now. So it's a, it's a very interesting kind of space we're in. I think there's another part. Sorry, Sorry, no. Yeah, w one thing that struck me and agree absolutely with Niall, I'm just thinking about it there, is we have a tendency to think about individuals, um, you know, and purpose mm -hmm. for the individual, purpose for, um, like, atomistically looking at them. But, but the reality is that a lot of people leave organizations, even though they individually see its purpose, are actually happy, got the camaraderie. It's because their peer group or family actually sets the expectations for them on the money side, you know, mm -hmm. because it's the breadwinner type model, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that, you know, you might stay with a company that's got a bad brand because you know its purpose is right, but it might be misunderstood in the market, but your friends, you know, kind of bounce you out saying, how could you work for that? You know, just mm -hmm. as, as a, for instance, for, for Ibeck, who, you know, would show up on the side of, of not the angels, <laughs> in the public perception, you know, the business often gets a wrap. It always struck me that, um, the members here, you know, would be in the day job, you'd be in the controversy at it. Um, but there's somebody at home watching it on TV, if it happens to be, you know, something that's on of public interest. And it's the kind of the granny or the granddad who might say that Ibeck is an awful place or that Ibeck is doing a good job. You know, it's the, it's the outside that can very often influence the stay. The individuals actually might want to stay. But mm -hmm. may feel I, I very seized by as I start to head to that age. You know, at, at twenty you worry what people think about you. Forties you stop worrying. At sixty you realize they were never thinking about you. So it depends on where they are in life cycle. I think you're right. I think they're like. I mean, there's always going to be a massive attraction to work for brands, like you know, like like working for Google or working for Apple or, or organizations like that, because there's a kind of a cool element to the brand. I think where you strip it down and you get to the actual nub of, you know, and it fascinates me, there's so much money spent on culture, on developing a culture, or, or there's, there's like astronomical amounts of money spent on leadership development. And it's almost always talking about, it's almost like there's this wisdom from the top that's imparted down to the, the, the body, uh, the body politic, you know. And I, I kind of feel like, like your culture is your relationships. If you've got a culture where you've got your CEO, you've got your senior management, you've got your middle management, you've got your, your rank and file, whatever way you want to call it, but they all actually have a means of communication with each other. Your culture yeah. will be solid. Where the culture breaks down is when you have these situations, and this was the challenge or is the challenge in, uh, if, if we want to call it a hybrid world, the only thing I would disagree with you, Danny, is that I don't think what we've been doing for the last two years is remote. I think we've been working from home, and there's a, there's a right. subtle difference. Yeah, because yeah. I, I don't think all organizations set us up to be, mm -hmm. you know, have an office at home or to work. Like a lot of people are working on the couch, juggling the kids and the, the, the dog and whatever. And that's a very different thing from actually the remote work model, if you know what I mean. Sure, yeah, but, absolutely. But, but, but I absolutely fundamentally agree with you about the challenges facing the, 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 the corporate world going forward. And I kind of feel like whilst there is this craziness around salaries at the moment, the reality is, is that the people you hire who are going to stay with you in the long term. And maybe maybe the future world of work is that you get people in for two years. They do a bit for you and then they move on again. Maybe that's the way it's going to be. But in order for you to have the best opportunity to retain your talent, you need a culture where you actually communicate with each other. And you need leaders who understand that the leader doesn't have to have all the answers. Usually the leader is the one who asks most of the questions. And I just wonder how you feel about that like, and, and, and what you're hearing kind of in with your organization about how you support your members and that kind of side of things. Yeah, I think, you know, the authentic leadership is one of the, the buzzwords that out there, but like the, the humble leader as well, in the sense yeah. of, to your point, knowing you don't have the answers, you couldn't possibly, it's, it's an irrational proposition to put forward uh, that one individual um, at top of an organization would even have more information. You know, even even by the isolation effect, yeah. um, by being there, it's going to be a sanitized um, information flow. Even um, 
So that idea of asking the questions, I think, allows to the point you're making to, um, it inverts it in the sense of presenting as the person who's asking most questions, not necessarily being the most ignorant, mm. just the one that's most curious, I think helps flatten an organization. Yeah. You know, um, um, and very often, as you will see, you know, the conversations actually, as you go up the seniority, become less complicated, less technical, you know, more relationship or trying to find character. Yeah. And which is, which is this fundamental idea about trust, you know, mm -hmm. so I think people would be surprised, particularly junior starting off, you know, particularly coming from college or wherever they might be coming from apprenticeships, they've got a lot of knowledge. And they think that what happens up the pyramid is it gets more techy, more sophisticated, yeah. more complicated. Yeah. And actually, the reality is it gets less. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think it's that feedback to allow that revelation <laughs> that the C-suite conversations are banal. Um, but actually, <laughs> within that banality, what's actually been sought for is trustworthiness, you know, to, for joint venture, for you know, for supply chain, for the stakeholder. Um, and that's communication and trust and, and building off your reputation, obviously, in your younger years. Yeah. And I think that's probably my point I was saying earlier on is there's a real danger of the talent idea and the payment that may not be productivity justified at the moment is that some people will, will actually lack that for the final part of their career. You mm. know, there'll be yeah. gaps of going through the sequence you can go through the sequence fast. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be fixed, but determined by years in the kind of old-fashioned uh, apprenticeship. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think, sorry, James, I just sorry, no, I was just going to add to that. Like, I, I think what we see then on the ground is, you know, at that manager level, be it mid-level, and 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 you know, that obviously is a lot where a lot of your work gets done. Definitely, there's been that sort of sense. The, 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 the squeeze in that area, you know, you talk about words as, as Danny touched on relationships, interpersonal skills, empathy. Obviously, these are the bud words in the market now. And, and some people going, can go to that very easily. But there's a large cohort of people that throughout their career maybe haven't gone on that journey. And now we're in a world where they've been asked to lead differently. Um, and and the center of gravity organizations isn't in the C suite. It's in the it's in the it's in the team. It's in the the people that are getting work done every week. You know that's where work gets done within your within your peer group within your team. And without that ability to have that interpersonal relationship element of what you're doing to build the trust to ultimately get the high performance culture that most organizations talk about and strive for. But what does it actually mean? So we see that on the ground, and, and ultimately that's. You know, if you talk about the environment, the manager needs to be part of that, and you need to try and bring him on a journey or her on a journey to 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 enable them to up their skills and and, and reskill at times, I guess as well. But I think Danny's on the money in terms of um some of that that pinch point. We we see that every day, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to say that uh, we 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 have this thing in in within the kind of pep talk offering. We do this thing called the leadership lab, and and I interview mm -hmm. various kind of leaders from all sorts of. Um, areas, but one of the guys I spoke to who I found fascinating was a neuroscientist, a guy called Paul Zak, uh, based in the States, and he has done an awful lot of research into the ROI of trust, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to, to actually see it when you break it into measurements, you know, because typically it's a, it's a feeling rather than mm -hmm. something solid you can measure, but what I thought was really interesting was it takes the conversation out of this kind of idea that you know, we all have to be best friends and we have to give each other a hug every day, you know, where a lot of people who are resistant to kind of these kind of real conversations and, 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 and this whole world of trust, kind of the, the, the fear is that I've got to become this person who is like really touchy-feely and lovey. And actually it's not. It's really about, you know, there's, there's a thing that I always talk about, are the great leaders are the ones who care. And Satya Nadella, the... the, the, the um, head of Microsoft, CEO of Microsoft, he had this lovely piece um, where he he talked about kind of the, the future. I, I, the, I don't know if, any, if people can read the screen there, but the bottom paragraph says, flexibility is what people desire, but you need to be able to discern the flexibility and then be able to re really be in touch with the people that you lead so that 
would so that would be care. So in other words, what he's saying is that care is the new currency. And care in the sense, like what I've learned from my work in the sports world, is that the great leaders who care, I did a really interesting chat um, last week with Dana Cavalli, who's the high performance director for the New York Yankees. And he's a very you know, harsh, straight-talking kind of guy. But his care for his players is that he will be 100% honest with them. He will tell them exactly where they're at. And if they're not playing, he will explain why. And he will tell them what they need to do to be, to, to be selected. So it's not about being friends or, you know, us all going on a campsite together. It's about having the, the, the care to just be straight with people. And Danny, I just, I'd love your opinion. I'm a conscious of the time and I'm, I'm taking up a lot of your time today. This is a fascinating conversation. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that kind of principle of trust and care and how that is potentially the future of what great leaders are going to be. Yeah, I think um, I think breaking that down a little bit and um, taking about that idea that care being the currency um, is at some level um, the the trust is the idea that the workplace is a transactional place, right? At some level, it's not just about money, as I said. Although I'm always minded of um, Spike Milligan's comment on that, which says, "All I ask for is the opportunity to show that money can't make me happy." Um, so um, the so there'll always be that quest for uh, for money, but I think on the care trust piece is an organisation that has trust is that people believe that collectively and at the individual level they're trying to do the right thing for each other. That I think is where the care, and I think that maybe what Nadal is, is talking about comes from. There's an ex, there is a kind of an inauthentic, or at least I feel it inauthentic. Um, management by walkabout, you know, um, somebody's got it in their diary that or the phone beeps and says, I'm going to walk about, you know, and, you know, go around to a desk and how are you doing today? How are you feeling today? For some people, if they are authentic, it'll come across, but for mm. other managers, it's inauthentic. It actually just makes people feel creepy, right? Yeah. Uh, and awkward. And I think there's a difference between that idea of care of nurture that we have in other environments like vocational, you know, health or education mm. or, or parenting. And I think we just need to be, that's probably not authentic in the workplace. The care is your duty of care, so to speak, is about the trust that you're trying to do the right thing for the organization in terms of all those dimensions, including making as much money as possible for distribution <laughs> uh, for everybody fairly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, James, uh, would you like to have the final word on this? Yeah, no. I mean, listen, I, I firstly want to thank Danny on behalf of Pep Talk for, for coming on and, and giving us his, 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 his wisdom. It was a really, really, it was a really, really interesting conversation. Um, and I think, yeah, listen, as, as you know, the care is a currency for me, you know, it is about trust. And, and the challenge for organizations now is very much the how. How do we build trust? when the world is shifting and we've so much uncertainty. And I think that that learn, therein lies the opportunity for organizations to remodel how they build trust, how they can care for their, for their entire organization and their employees in maybe a different way than they've done before. So um, yeah, no, listen, thanks a million. Thanks a million today, Niall for setting, you know, Niall and the marketing team, Danny for coming on and sharing your wisdom and, and um, um, hopefully we get a chance to chat again soon. Thanks That's for right. joining us. Danny. Bye everybody. Take care guys. Thanks. Thank you.